This week, we're taking a look at some of the most compelling true crime trials we've analyzed. And we're going to take apart, decode, and then explain what every cue, tell, and movement means from a professional body language perspective. So grab your notebook and settle in. All right, you ready? Here we go. You've indicated in your direct examination that you were uh, sexually abused by your father and your mother. Is that correct? I don't think so. I w didn't use those words. Well, but isn't that the gist of what you were saying? That you were the victim of sexual abuse? Um, with my father and with my mother, I just said what happened, and I think it was mutual. All right. Okay. Uh, Greg, you want to go first? Sure. I'll take this one. So he is either figuratively or literally sitting on his hands. That's coaching. Not to use your hands because you give away information. These guys could afford a good attorney and good preparation. Don't know who they had. I didn't go look into it, but I'm sure they had somebody who would help them. Well, hold on. Not my mother. My mother. I just said what happened. You can hear him saying, well, hold on, not my mother. I don't think so. I w didn't use those words. This is his personality coming out. This is him controlling. Now, guys, nothing coming out of these guys' mouth is pleasant and anything you want. We intentionally clean this up. Nothing coming out of their mouth is something you'd be going, well, hold on, I want to get the nuance exactly right on, unless that's in your DNA. And it is. You can see it. There's his personality. Well, hold on. You can see it. Hold on. And then he goes the small chunk details. He even does a posture shift once he's clarified it. He straightens up in the t in the in the place where he says, "I don't think I use those words." Well, it was, but it was with my mother mutual. And then he does a nodding, and that nodding is not a positive thing. It's just affirming that he's cleaned up this thing. And then he does an eye lock when it's over. You can see his respirations up, and you can see he's trying to set the record straight. Guys, that's pretty clearly this guy. If I if I w am expecting truth from him, I think that's what you're seeing. He could have let something pass very casually, but he was trying to take away guilt from his mother in this horrible situation. And if you don't know this and you go look for it, you're going to find it's very graphic. So be cautious. But this is a complex, messy story and nothing good about it. OK, uh, with that, Scott. All right. People have been abused when, when they're little children. They become powerful observers. And I think that's what we're seeing in this, because when something happens, they lock right into it and they start watching the person who's asking them a question, the person who's approaching them. The, and they see things from a childhood to now that, that it takes forever for people to, to get used to seeing and pay atten paying attention to. That's why I believe he freezes well, every time she starts talking. He starts and his head starts going down because he's try he's preparing to protect himself from whatever it might be because he's freezing to observe and watch everything that's going on and listen. In case something's coming at him, he's got to figure out how to say, how to say something back. I think that's why ne neither he or... Eric look alarmed. They don't look like they're, they don't have that thing of their surprise when somebody's asking them a question that that's a little bit from the left, from left field because they're used to it. That's why I think their delivery is calm and the demeanor is just calm. Everything's out. Even though they're talking about horrific things, they just you move right along. Like there's no big thing happening. But again, the subtleties are there and you see his head tilt back and forth again a little bit as he's thinking. I think this is one of the things that lets you know something's going on with his internal dialogue where he's thinking, like Greg was saying, he's thinking, he's going through things. How am I going to word this? Those th he's not thinking, quote unquote, how am I going to word this? But he's putting things in place. How he's going to deliver at that point. I think when we see, when he's talking about his dad. You were the victim of sexual abuse. Um, with my father. That's when his, his shoulder comes forward just a little bit. That left shoulder comes a little bit forward as he moves in. And then he moves back some when he starts talking about his dad, because I think he's in fear of his father. He fears his father, but I don't think he's afraid of his mother. I think he's angry that his mother didn't do some things she should have done. She didn't take, didn't take up for him when she should have, when she should have or had the chance. He didn't do that. But we see fear in him when that, when that starts, not as much on his expression, but these little subtle things that say he's, he's afraid of his father. That's what I'm seeing in there anyway. But with his mother, nothing. He's moving forward when he's talking about his mother. My mother, I just... And not moving forward aggressively. His his head goes up a little bit as he starts talking about her very, very briefly. But that's what I'm seeing there, especially when he says it was mutual. Not that he was trying to protect his mother or anything, but I don't think he sees, he feels the fear from his mother the same way he feels the, the fear from his father. Two completely different things. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so remember in the 
that first little chat we had, I was talking about there's something interesting that he tries to get this moment of social approval on this negative idea. No, not this time. In this one, he's going against a social norm immediately. He's reframing the idea of a sexual relationship with parents as um, kind of not, not abuse in Every society that I come across, the idea of sexual relationships with your immediate family is is what we call taboo. It's a social norm of going, that isn't something that you do. He's totally reframing that. I've got somebody here who's going to try and convince me around what I would normally think shouldn't be happening. That's kind of okay for it to be happening. So it's already got fairly odd for me now why is that ha- why is that going on is that because something has been happening in this family that is very unusual and 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 we should be convinced that that's kind of okay or is there another motive of he's in some kind of corner and has to say that so as we're going through i'm just interested in unpacking why immediately straight off the bat is he going against some social norms, pretty odd behavior, and very cool at the moment, generally about going around those, so, against those social norms, quite calculated at the moment, in my view, around going against social norms. So interesting. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yep, you guys have uh, hit all the points that I was gonna talk about here. But I want you to think about what would the behavior look like or what would a response look like to a person who doesn't define that as abuse? And we're seeing it. He's seeing the world through that lens. Like that is a normal thing. He knows that society doesn't think it's normal, but he knows that he grew up this way. So he views the world through a very different lens, Uh, much like people who keep tigers. It's a completely different deal. It's a whole different lens to view the world. The only thing uh, I had that you guys didn't mention was there's a a flash of anger, downward eyebrow movement at the word abuse. You were uh, sexually abused. Specifically at the word abuse during the question. So that's good to see there. That's all I got. Nice. Hey, one one quick note, guys. This was cross-examination. Don't know if we mentioned that. This part is. Yeah. Hmm. You've indicated in your direct examination that you were uh, sexually abused by your father and your mother. Is that correct? I don't think so. I didn't use those words. Well, but isn't that the gist of what you were saying? That you were the victim of sexual abuse? Um, With my father and with my mother, I just said what happened. And I think it was mutual. Today's video is sponsored by Aura, and it's a super important time to be talking about them because hackers might have stolen the social security numbers of every single American. Over 2.9 billion records were stolen from national public data, which offers personal information to employers, private investigators, staffing agencies, and other people just doing background checks. So these stolen records that they took include all kinds of personal data your full name your social security number your phone number along with all these other alternate pieces of data that can follow you along for a long time and members of this hacker group have reportedly released this information for free online online so this is obviously super serious and there's no way to go back in time after something like this happens if you weren't taking precautions with your personal information online before, this should be a giant wake-up call. You've never been more vulnerable online than you are right now. But I'm not too worried about it because I use Aura now. Aura alerts me instantly if they find my phone number, my email, my social on the dark web, and they're gonna let me know as fast as they can if anybody tries to use this information to access my credit or bank accounts and they give me up to $5 million in identity theft insurance. Aura also provides a ton of other features to help keep you safe online, all inside one app. So you can go to our link today, aura.com 
TBP to try 14 days free. That'll be enough time for Aura to find out if any of your personal data has been exposed already. I highly recommend you do this right now because not only is national public data not going to do anything to help you, they probably aren't even going to face repercussions or consequences for this leak. So I don't want to leave myself and my family vulnerable to data breaches. And if you feel the same way, you can go to Aura.com slash TBP to try two weeks for free. Did you literally just say that was for the police's benefit? That was literally what I said. I marked the box for the police's benefit so that I could find it again when the police came back. For and what? I, well, I sort of thought that if the police didn't find something, they would want to come back and re-interview and I would be able to show them things. I thought the fact that all they had was Dan's uh, phone and not a computer from us might not, had, they may have reached a dead end and said, Mrs. Brophy, is there anything you can give us that would help? Any electronic equipment, anything else? So I was kind of in my mind making a list. I At that point, silly me, since I believed I didn't kill my husband, I didn't think I was a uh, wit a uh, serious uh, suspect. Despite you telling people that you were. I told people I was a suspect because it's always the wife. All right. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This is going to be a good one. I, I think one thing in here, she almost accidentally calls herself a witness. I didn't think I was a uh, witness. A, uh, Instead of a suspect. Uh, suspect. Which I think is weird, but there's an even bigger one here. And this is the phrase, I believed I didn't kill my husband. I, at that point, silly me, since I believed I didn't kill my husband. It's not that it's a fact. It's just a belief that she has. And right here, there's a single shoulder shrug just before this. There's a strong increase in her loss of fluency here. Her cognitive loads up because there's some deception going on, most likely. And you can see this with the sudden shift in posture and hand hiding and an eyebrow raise for special approval for this thing right here. There's just a there's a ton of stuff in here. I'm sure you guys will will unpack. Scott. All right. Now we're starting to see things change a little bit. We're seeing uh, bigger illustrators. We're seeing her hands come up and using those as as her brain. illustrators are, are the way your brain emphasizes specific words or phrases. And that's the way we that's what we're talking about. when We all say illustrators. And this is because she's confident and prepared for this. She's thought about this this question. I'm sure her attorney brought this question up. And so she's ready for it. She's got her answer. And so she delivers it. I marked the box for the police's benefit so that I could find it again when the police came back. She's expecting the police to come back. That's why she's ready for this, because she knows they'll be back, because she knows there's nobody else out there that killed this guy because it was her. So she's ready for that. And when she's deconflicting this, he starts as asking other questions that she's not prepared for, just like he did in the, in the other ones. And there's an imbalance with her body language at this point because her indignance and her body language aren't saying the same thing. Her being her being indignant and all, it should her head should come forward with her eyebrows knitted like this instead of up and back like this as she's being in, indignant. That suggests more arrogance than indignance for this where it should it should be different so that imbalance there lets us know that she's actually stepped in something and it's and she's trying to get out of it and to have a little problem getting away uh mark what do you got uh yeah so look i mean if we didn't know that she killed her husband i mean or, or, or at least you know she'd been convicted of that the first two videos you'd probably be kind of interested in but by the time it comes to this third video you are kind of oh well yeah clearly because there is such a, a, a mass of signals that suggest uh deception and and the questioning at that point has got more um incisive so look there are a number of pronounced single shoulder shrugs however just to your point chase there is one that comes it's actually a little bit smaller than the other pronounced ones along with a, a tongue jut as well which we often um put alongside the idea of kind of pushing food out of your mouth. Something something is distasteful. Something isn't good about what's going on. There's an adapter there stroking the back of her hand that comes at the same time. That The head springs back at that point. There's 
lip compression as well and and a loss of fluency uh, in that the words and the ideas become more staccato. It's not fluid anymore. And all of this around, I didn't think I was a serious suspect. I didn't think I was a, uh, with a uh, serious uh, suspect. So... Clearly, we'd put alongside that, yeah, you did think you were a very serious suspect. In fact, you were the only suspect because you know you did this. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Greg, what do you got? Oh, hang on. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So, guys, you cover most everything I have. And, Chase, I was right on with you. The same things. The single biggest shoulder shrug I may have ever seen in all these shows we've done was when she was saying that, after that so I could find it again. However, I don't think she stumbled into this. I think she used a very artful tool. She used a provocative statement saying, I labeled the boxes so I could find them later for the police, hoping that he would step into our iterative storytelling. Look, guys, I, I would say if you're a lawyer and you're trying to decide whether to put your person on the stand or not, and you're not sure, call us. This is not a good move because this is one hour. All of this video we're gonna show you came out of one hour. She's on the stand for many hours. What she does is she starts to iteratively story tell, and she's selling the hell out of what she's written in this manuscript that she plans to talk about this. So she's comfortable until a couple of things start to fall away. And then you're dead. The other one I love, Chase, is that when she says, I believed I was not, didn't kill my husband, I believed. Then there's a lot of movement, stammering as she starts to say that. And then she goes to a uh, 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 serious suspect. That's her brain playing squirrel in the road, moving around. But because she's older, she doesn't move as much. She doesn't stammer quite as rapidly. She doesn't move quite as much as a younger person might. And then at the very end, there's a silent mouthing again. She goes, somebody who can read lips, if you could tell what she's saying, Please write it in the comments because she does it several times in here. I think it's for the good of counsel. Not sure. But she also has hearing issues. So don't know. But yeah, this is a really starting to come apart story. And if you felt like you had a good candidate to put on the stand, you don't know what you're doing. Call us. That's it. <laughs> Did you literally just say that was for the police's benefit? That was literally what I said. I marked the box for the police's benefit so that I could find it again when the police came back. For and what? I, well, I sort of thought that if the police didn't find something, they would want to come back and re-interview and I would be able to show them things. I thought the fact that all they had was Stan's uh, phone and not a computer from us might not, had, they may have reached a dead end and said, Mrs. Brophy, is there anything you can give us that would help? Any electronic equipment, anything else? So I was kind of in my mind making a list. I, at that point, silly me, since I believed I didn't kill my husband, I didn't think I was a uh, with a uh, serious uh, suspect. Despite you telling people that you were, I told people I was the suspect because it's always the wife. All right. We all know now because you have revealed the puzzle piece. She's a blackmailer. Can we agree on that? I believe sitting here in 2023 yes. that she was in on the extortion for yes. sure. Yes. So is it okay if I refer to her as a blackmailer? I think there's a difference between blackmail and extortion, but yeah, okay. at sitting here today we can. Sure. We'll, ex we'll refer to her as an extortionist. So this, this woman, the extortionist, is going to do you a solid by negotiating with the Latin Kings for you to get on a payment plan for the extortion. Isn't that what happened? What you're doing is you're taking what we know in 2003 and trying to say, this is what I knew in 2014. There's Did she put you on a payment plan? Yes, she's, she said, because I didn't have the money, she said, ask me if I could pay $3,000 a month in 2014. And I said, yes, I can. Did you hear any of the conversation where she was making these negotiations on your behalf? No, when she said, I'm gonna go check with my friend and if that's okay with him, she took her purse, took her keys, took her cell phone, she walked out of my front door, closed the door behind her, and I sat in my living room and she came back about five minutes later. You didn't wanna to talk to the guy yourself? No, I didn't even think of that. I mean, but she went outside to call him. 
All right, and then the two of you took a Xanax and went to sleep. <clears throat> well, I, I took a Xanax. I don't know if she took one out of the bottle, but I, I definitely did. And the next morning, she left with your money, right? All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just how extreme the contrast is here between these, you know, two central parties here. Uh, you got uh, Adelson here. We are still getting a little bit of this kind of uh, these elbows coming out. Uh, I, I think I think everybody's right. I don't think it's because there's some kind of illustrative gestures going going on there. I just think it is that little moment of confidence now and again in what he's saying. I think could be absolutely right. It could be confidence in in the rehearsal, confidence in in the story. Uh, but in, in in my terminology, most of the time he's there, he's in what I would call first circle, which means that some other part of his arms is touching some other part of his body, and every now and again, a bit of space is made here. So compare that to the prosecution there, where she is going in often into what I would call third circle, where these these joints here are almost locking out, almost locking out, but you get a lot of space between that. One is supremely more confident than the other. Why? Because it's taking up more space. Now, does that mean that uh, one is more of a truth teller than the other? No. Sometimes if, you were, if you're wanting to do a really good lie, you know, you might gesture out because you really want to prove it and and in in those cases sometimes we see the gestures uh leave the frame completely i don't think we're ever with adelson going to see his gestures ever leave the frame but somebody here has a point to make and that's the prosecution and she really is filling the space here uh making herself the most entertaining thing on the screen i don't mean entertaining in a negative way i mean with, without her without her in these clips uh, you, we'd have very little to keep oh. keep your attention right now uh so uh, and i think you know there's a potential that she knows that for the court as well and she knows that and she knows this is a big this is po a popular uh crime at the moment, and this is a chance to make her name. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it is entertaining what she's doing there. Why is it entertaining? Because we know what's happening. We can see what she's trying to do. It's really clear, and he is not that clear. One is more contained. One's more demonstrative. What does that tell us? Well, we'll find out as we go further along. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, he's, there's nothing here to lie about. He's talking about the story of her going outside to talk to this guy, this hitman, whether he's talking about her talking to him about murder or about blackmail, doesn't matter. The same details would still apply. She went outside, she took this door, she, she took her stuff with her, went out and talked. So in effect, one of the best lies you can tell if you're gonna lie is transference. I take an incident that happened and I transfer it to a new location or a new time. It's easy, I know all the details. I just rattle off those details. It makes it hard to break because it's a real factual account, just happens to not be used to describe what I'm describing. So it's a transference. Um, now, a couple of things. When you're on the stand and an attorney is trying to make you out to think you're smarter than everybody around and that you think you're going to figure your way out, that is not the time to displace smart ass. It is not the time. You, If I were coaching this guy, I would have said, the last thing you want to do is verbally joust with the attorney and she's trying to make you look like you think you're smarter than everybody else. It comes across that way. He's parsing words. She was in on the extortion for yes. sure. Yes. So is it okay if I refer to her as a blackmailer? I think there's a difference between blackmail and extortion, but yeah, okay. at sitting here today, we can. Sure. We'll, ex we'll refer to her as an extortionist. Arguing about whether a person is a blackmailer or an extortionist? What do you think average people sitting in the gallery are thinking? Never mind those 12 sitting that are going to decide your fate in three hours. I think you said it was, Chase. So it's tough. You got to be very careful. When you watch her, the other one, I, I always talk about requests for approval, this forehead up thing. That's not what she's doing here. When he gets into that discussion about whether it's blackmail or extortion, when her forehead goes up, that's disbelief. Because if you look, there's other stuff that goes along with it. And you can see that her face is up that's up like this she's got a half smile and her eyes are amused that's disbelief that is not a request for approval and then finally as she says <laughs> didn't you ask to talk to him it's funny you hear that lilt in his voice never thought of that 
No, I didn't even think of that. Really funny to think that he might have gotten into the situation. If it were really true, you would think you'd say, hey, let me talk to this guy. I, I, I want to find out what he wants. I don't want this third party. Considering that we now know, comment, it sounded a lot like Prince Andrew, but considering that we now know, comment, that made him look like the smart ass, what we now know is that she was in the middle of all that. His respiration climbs a bit, but that's it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, absolutely agree. And Mark, it's funny you mentioned uh, first circle because I was fired from the position of second triangle in middle school. Uh, in New York. It's not good, dude. Yeah. What did you do? Bad. I screwed it up real bad. I guess I played it like a square. But in this video, oh. he does something here that I teach to private clients that almost works for him but he does it the wrong way. And there are literally 22 ways to make somebody cross-examining you look really stupid. And he tries one of them here in this clip. And if there's one takeaway from this that you can kind of write down in a notebook if you're watching this, the technique shown is a technique blown. So when you verbally bring up a technique being used by a person, it reduces the influential power of that technique to almost zero. So he's trying uh, to kind of do that here, but he's doing it the wrong way. Uh, Greg, exactly like you said. And there's a formula to follow to make it stick in the jury's brain the right way. and He's not using it. And then there's emotional accessing which we might see a whole lot in the future. And that may just be a regular spot for him, but it's about this conversation with this woman before she goes outside to make this call. And I'd imagine maybe this was an emotional time for him, uh, but this is something I would definitely want to drill in a bit uh, more on. That's all I got here, Scott. Some of the illustrators we see from the, from the attorney are a little bit odd because she does that big hand wave out this way. But like I said earlier, she she's using this to her advantage because she's saying everybody knows. Everybody knows this. So that's why that one hand goes out there. Everybody, that's what she's saying. It sort of sticks there. And then she uses a regulator, almost like she's trying to keep him from talking. He's not going to say anything, but she's like holding him back from saying something. Slowly but surely, she gets up, up in his head with all these things, and, he, and we see his stress go through the roof on this. We all know now, because you have revealed the puzzle piece, she's a blackmailer. Can we agree on that? I believe sitting here in 2023 yes. that she was in on the extortion for yes. sure. Yes. So is it okay if I refer to her as a blackmailer? I think there's a difference between blackmail and extortion, but yeah, okay. at sitting here today, we can. Sure. We'll, ex we'll refer to her as an extortionist. So this, this woman, <coughs> the extortionist, is going to do you a solid by negotiating with the Latin Kings for you to get on a payment plan for the extortion. Isn't that what happened? What you're doing is you're taking what we know in 2003 and trying to say, this is what I knew in 2014. There Did she put you on a payment plan? Yes, she's, she said, because I didn't have the money, she said, ask me if I could pay $3,000 a month in 2014 and i said yes i can did you hear any of the conversation where she was making these negotiations on your behalf no when she said i'm going to go check with my friend and if that's okay with him she took her purse took her keys took her cell phone she walked out of my front door closed the door behind her and i sat in my living room and she came back about five minutes later you didn't want to talk to the guy yourself no, I didn't even think of that. I mean, but she went outside to call him. All right, and then the two of you took a Xanax and went to sleep. <clears throat> well, I, I took a Xanax. I don't know if she took one out of the bottle, but I, I definitely did. And the next morning, she left with your money, right? You can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon 
You know, like your rubber balloon, like a... Mm -hmm. At which point, I poked my head out, you know, as we were coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Okay. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she She's on laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with the knife in her abdomen. Okay. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing lures. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen? Yes. When you came out of the bathroom? Yes. What did you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help? Yes or no? The answer is no. All right, well, I'll go first on this one. When he talks about coming out of the bathroom, he says, as we were coming out of the bathroom, he's the only guy there. So it makes me wonder what the hell's going on up on up in his head. What's this guy thinking about? Is he, th is he thinking, I don't believe he's got multiple personalities or anything like that, but what's he thinking? Why is he saying as we came out of the bathroom? It's really, really odd. That should, and the attorney should have caught that and said, what are you talking about? But at the, on the other's, and if she had caught it, what is she going to say? You said, oh, I'm sorry, I just meant me. Then you can't dig into psychology from that point. Um, but from that point of view, it's just kind of odd looking. You see him adapting by swaying back and forth from that chair. And his details are just finely tuned. He's got it all down, the green knife and corrects her on that. All those things are real stickler for these, really, these details that you don't need. Nobody needs to know any of that stuff. They're too intricate for real, for real storytelling. That's what inhibits the uh, the loping. That's why we're not hearing much of that. Um, when it, when it, the, the details are so intricate, for example, I thought this was a good one. When a director directs a movie and you, and you have an actor, and there's a situation and the actor says, well, I've got to go over to so-and-so's house or go over there to, you know, miles away, I'll drive. The director doesn't have them show them saying goodbye, walking out the door, open the door, shutting the door behind him, walking out to the car, opening the car door, getting in, starting the car, putting on their seatbelt, adjusting the, and then driving off and then showing up, getting out of the car, that whole scene. They just show them showing up over there or they show them leaving in the car or driving up and that's it. That's it. These details mean nothing in the story. And it's just, and that's the, these are, every time he gives one, it says flag, 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 because it's so odd and so out of, out of character for a real story, you know? Um, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. This is a fantastic study for the beginner who's just getting into body language and trying to study deception, what to look for. That's all we're really seeing here are just cues of deception, pretty much. I mean, there's we're going to see him going to fight or flight here in a while, but this is this is just great for you to to look at and study. A lot of lot going on here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is going to start a two part story. Okay, Scott, come in. I see Scott there with a knife, stabbing himself and cutting his <laughs> inferior vena cava. Yeah. And I go, hey, Scott, where's your phone? Does anybody yeah. believe that? Does anybody believe that's what's happening? Does anyone really believe that a guy's going to walk up and the way he's going to try to stop his wife from slicing a major artery is to talk to her about her phone? That's not how life works. Aside from the fact she has a knife in her hand, he walks in, she's got it in her gut, just working around cutting an artery. Okay, we believe that for a minute. He's calm, but this is three years later. He's told this story, and he's doing that romance here. I'm not kidding you. Like, he's got his eyes locked because he's trying to see what she believes and what she doesn't. And that smart assery thing he does with little short clips to his questions and answers just keeps coming up. I don't know. I don't recall. This is the only place when he's talking about where were you and was the door open, that stuff, that his signaling is actually congruent because it's non-pertinent and he doesn't care whether she knows something or not. He edits and adjusts, and he says she is standing, but that's very much a New England, Northeastern kind of thing. I had a good friend who would say, I'm working in the city for 35 years. So that's just a speech pattern thing. You don't read too much into that. 
There is some disgust when he talks about hearing something that sounded like a balloon. Makes me think that's probably what it sounded like when he did something. And that went through his head because you see his nose wrinkle in disgust and his face, Chase, as you always say, moved to the center. Really good way to put it. He goes into a lot of detail about the sheets and where she was lying and all that. That must have some pertinence in the way he's going to explain away blood patterns or something. Don't know. But then he gets meticulous with that green handle knife and you see him go back and attack that. He should stay this way through the rest of the story and we're going to see that fall apart because we always say the pattern that you use should be the pattern you use for the rest of the time. And I'll just, I'll, I'll hop over that last one and then say, this is just an iterative story. And where's that emotion he was displaying for the jury when he's talking about his wife disemboweling herself in front of him? This is just broken. And you can't miss all of that when he says, when he answers no, watch his lips and his chin withdraw. The, this guy's not believable. Scott, you're right. Everything that we teach, the most simple things are here, but they're in grand scale because he thinks he's outthought them. And every person, when they get on the stand, every person when they face an interrogator has their story made up. This guy's put a lot of time into it. He's had three years. And he's having to recant something he said before. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, the one thing he's got in common with Amber Heard, he thinks he's got them fools. <laughs> and that's he has confidence and stress at the same time, which makes these uh, behaviors more exaggerated. But there's more details here about trivial BS than any of the deaths of the kids or discovering uh, that they were dead in the first place. In very, very rare cases throughout my entire career, I will say something is definitively deceptive. This is one of them. If you hear a story where minute, stupid details are just vividly injected and then the critical moments are just carelessly walked through, like someone reading a clothing uh, laundry label, that's deception. That is deception. You don't need many clusters, but here's the clusters we're seeing. We're seeing a detail spike, or let's call it a detail mountain. We're seeing a detail mountain with irrelevant BS, and we're seeing a detail valley when it comes to critical. Then we see another detail mountain when it comes to irrelevant BS. That's deception. And notice there's no emotion, no crying, no screaming, no care, no worry, no love, no anger, no sound that he's describing, no feeling. He's a physical therapist. His wife is a school teacher. Inferior vena cava is not something that she would say, in my opinion, I don't think. And I love how she's just stabbing herself and casually saying this and just very medically and clinically describing the exact name of the vein as she's stabbing herself in the stomach. It's just a casual conversation between medically educated people that the jury probably wouldn't understand. And I think that's exactly what's going on in his head. The jury's not going to get this. This is a really highly educated word. It's going to make the jury automatically believe me. I think that's what he's thinking. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's look at some nonverbals that are going around those spikes of, of detail, because I agree with you on that. We get the first, um, first time we've seen a moderator or regulator gesture out of him like this, which is a stop, a halt and suppress. So he comes in at a kind of a 45 degree angle, uh, green handled knife. So he wants, he wants the whole of this situation to just halt for a moment while he gives this piece of detail. We can't quite work out why this might be so important. Maybe it is pertinent to evidence, maybe not, I don't know. I think he just, it's a moment for him to go, I'll control this for a moment. Because he's hasn't got a lot of control, and my guess is his control is has some relative importance to him, especially as you've been saying, Chase, the suppression of something. So we get that nice, it's not fully suppressive, yeah, but it halts the proceedings and just pats down on that idea of the green handled knife. Then we get a beautiful example of the aloof eye block, which is when, uh, and, and Chase brought this to our attention many times ago around, what was it, the, the, the neighbor who's just got a solar panel yeah. on there. On well, that's good for the environment, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so that I'm going to call the aloof eye block. It says, what it says is, I'm so much more bigger and important and more intelligent than you that I can't even look at you. I can't even look at you and you maybe shouldn't even be able to see me. And so, because I'm, you know, high on the pedestal and therefore, because I can't close your eyes, 
I'll close my own so it feels like you can't see me and I can't and I wouldn't ever deign to look at you. And we get that on the idea of when the stenographer, I think, says, can you repeat that? And he repeats inferior vena cava as if to say, come on, you idiot. Everybody knows the inferior vena cava. Everybody knows that. And that beautiful aloof eye block. Great example of that. Again, controlling the situation. Great moment where he's controlling some of the elements, the instruments of the court. Probably feeling pretty good for him. Um, you can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon. You know, like you rub a balloon, like a... Mm -hmm. At which point, I poke my head out you know, as we're coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Okay. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she She's on laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with the knife in her abdomen. Okay. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing lures. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen? Yes. When you came out of the bathroom? Yes. What did you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help? Yes or no? The answer is no. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial. Is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Chase, what do you got? So I'm going to leave body language out of this for right now. So I want you to consider something from a profiling only perspective. So if someone's family members are killed and they wanna find out what happened, what reasonable or sane person would lie about their story? So what are the circumstances where immediately after a murder or an incident like this, a person decides to lie about their day? So in a lot of cases, guilty people are gonna to admit to one lie so they can appear to be coming clean. We might call this a micro or a mini confession. I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. And this sometimes serves to alleviate this natural human desire to confess. And this admission about lying makes guilty people feel like they're admitting fault. And unconsciously, they believe that they're shaping how we see them. So if they're coming clean about this one thing, they must not be guilty. So that might be something that we're seeing here. And this is just a tremendous red flag that the, the lie is there existing in the first place. Mark? Uh, yeah, so he is very good at not answering with yes or no answers as the prosecutor is trying to rally him in, into simple yes or no. Uh, he'll tend to 
repeat the question back in the opposite of how it's been put forward. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial, is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. Again, not contracted, so very clear and uncontracted in telling you the opposite of what he's being rallied into. And I think that's that's purposeful. He knows what the prosecutor is trying to do, get him to say yes or no answers. It's going to be simpler to, to put him in a corner if he'll do yes or no. Let me just pick up on one element of body language, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, you're right, Greg. We didn't, in the, um, in the first visit with the police, see any forehead action. We got a lot of forehead action here. So we've got to think to ourselves, well, is he is he putting it on to show concern or is he actually concerned and under pressure? In order to work out which one it is, I would put alongside that that his his chest is very concave at the moment. Shoulders are in, chest is concave, protecting vital organs on the body, as we, we often say. So I might bias towards the stress the stress in the forehead is potentially real stress at this point, not a concern that he's putting on for the audience. Now, I, I could be wrong, it could be the opposite, but all I'm saying to you is, look, I'm trying to put information together to come to a best, a best guess conclusion, and then always test my guesses, test my guesses about what else do I see? What else do I know? What do my friends around me think it is? What do other experts around me think it is? So at the moment, I would bias towards He's th though he's used to this situation from not the, the side that he's on at the moment, but the other side, though he's used to that court, he's not used to being here. He could be under real stress and pressure here. Uh, Greg, what do you think? What do you got on this one? Yeah, let's start off by talking about the liar's loop, something Scott and I have in the, in the true crime workshop. But the liar's loop says you get a trigger and then you got to fabricate and then you get to you deconflict inside your head. Then you pitch, then you get challenged. Now, when you get challenged, you have to defend. And then what happens to you is you get in a spiral if, they, if the questioner is doing a good job. Well, he had time between the time he actually executed. Let's assume he killed her. He had time or his family. He had time after he killed to fabricate for information while he was waiting for the police and 911. Now, we're going to hear a lot of really interesting details as we go. So he's deconflicted that stuff in his head. And Chase, what you're talking about. I think is a pave, kind of a paving stone. If I flip this paving stone over, you won't check the rest. We'll say there's where the problem is. And what he's doing, I always call that trading guilt. He'll throw out some guilt. It's an ultimate redirect. Look, I lied. I lied. I'm sorry I lied. And you redirect to there. We'll find out later when he said he lied. And interestingly for the four of us, we all saw it. When he was in the car, we knew something changed. All this red flagged his baseline deviation. And he admits that's when he decided to lie. But interestingly, He's got all that grief muscle, the concern, all this stuff showing up in his head. And we say grief muscle is the arch, but these muscles actually are part of that. And that grief muscle is a combination of five muscles. I want you to listen to the difference in the way he responds to the first two questions. One is telling, boom, boom. I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And the other is halting and shifting as he goes through it. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. So something has changed in the way he is responding to the two questions. He's got something there that he did before. Um, that's good enough. I'll just leave it at that. And Scott, what do you got? I think right here, um, his story didn't work. So he's trying to come in, he's coming with something else and it's messed up his timeline. So he's having to go back and try to correct that. I think that's part of what's given the stress here as well. But at the same time, he's so focused on that prosecutor because his blink rate is low. His eyes are a little bit wise compared to what they've been in the, in what we've seen up to this point. When he has that direct eye contact, when they lock, it lasts even longer. I mean, it, between blinks. So I think that was really interesting. Uh, he doesn't use any illustrators at all. He's really still. And that's, that lets us know something's up here because he's really careful about what he's saying. He has to catch everything perfectly because this could be the question that sends him to the pokey for the rest of his life. That's what I got. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial, is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative.
except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Okay. Um, I want to talk about where you went when you left your residence on the day of the murder. You tried to turn on to Trescott, and then you ended up where? I went... Um, I was supposed to go to a party that night, a stock the bar party, so I went to a liquor store to pick up what they had asked for as the present for their party. Um, so I went to the liquor store, I picked up the alcohol, I stopped, I think I got gas, and then I went to lunch to meet my friends. And the liquor store purchase appears to have occurred at 12.49 based on the receipt. Do you have any reason to dispute that No, timing? that sounds right. Okay, and then from there to the restaurant? Yes. And where was the restaurant located? Um, Mosaic. I actually don't remember. I just remember I would go north on uh, Thomasville Road. All right. And, so it was and is the restaurant where law enforcement came to speak with you and you ended up going with them to the police station, right? That's correct. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, watch the impact of all these things we've been talking about, about the back and forth, because her entire respiration is all up here now. And you see her whole body moving as she's talking. It's it or she's breathing in heavy. It's almost like she's heaving. This response may sound a little bit rehearsed because I think she's probably come up with exactly how she's going to tell this story over time. Does that mean it's a lie? Don't think so. And we know that she has evidence for all those places she went because she was at the restaurant at this time. She was at a liquor store at this time. So all she's doing is telling her story. And one of the things it does point out, Scott, Vray says bigger illustrators are probably more often true than deceptive. And we see that in her. She's doing all the right stuff. There, there are a couple of things here that that are interesting for me, though. Um, all the elements of what she's saying here are true. And then she does something that you'll see in your life every day. When you get in an altercation with somebody and you're going back at it, back and forth and back and forth, the first time you find common ground and people do it naturally, guys like me who would take advantage of it, know that you're feeling that way when you immediately become over accommodating. Because the first common ground you get when you're in an altercation, you over accommodate. You're trying to get back to common with them. People that know that can take advantage of you and manage that and manage your delivery of that and make you feel stupid, make you feel manipulated, or make you do something for them. So just be cautious when you're doing that. And realize that it's innate in humans to try to mend that bridge as quickly as you can. But be careful that people don't take advantage of that, manipulate it, and turn it back on you. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So, look, for me, the timeline and this wind-back gesture that she's doing, for me, that seems congruent. That seems like it makes sense. Chase, I'll come to you next because I'd like to hear your view on on, on whether it makes sense for you, but it feels, feels right uh, to me. But there is something about it which is quite laboured. So I think... Um, though it's accurate what she's talking about, she needs us to know exactly how accurate this is. And also, I think it's laboured because she is a little bit off balance throughout all of this. I think to everybody's point here, the 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 attorney has done a job of destabilising her. I think she's destabilised. I think the information is accurate, but she's trying to find clear balance throughout this and 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 get herself back on point. I think the eyes go to the right kind of place as well for her to be recalling actual directions. Uh, but Chase, I'd be interested in if you see any subtlety in that that, that doesn't quite ring true. What do you, what do you got? Uh, it's like you we teed this up. It's perfect. So right, I'll right. tell you exactly what you saw and exactly why that seemed off. Let me tell you something about what I did today, and all of it's going to be true. I woke up this morning, I had some coffee, and I filmed a YouTube video. Something is missing here because I did two things in a row, and then I go like this to talk about the third thing. So I went to the liquor store, I picked up the alcohol, I stopped, I think I got gas, and then I went to lunch to meet my friends. There's something here in this timeline that she's built here 
from her left to her right, which is how we typically build timelines. And I'm moving from my right to your left, so it makes more sense. So she starts out with this, I did this thing, this thing, and then I did this. I wonder what was going on inside of this one foot long window when two giant chores that might've taken half an hour are this big. What happened inside that little window? And Mark, you're right, her eye home or where she normally looks to access information up and to her right is there. Scott, what do you got? All right. <clears throat> now, has anybody been thinking about those that adapter I was talking about earlier? Nonstop. Okay. <laughs> because in this one, she does in this clip, she does it 37 times. And it's it's one of those things that's hidden in plain sight. And it's something she does over and over and over again. And I went back and watched, once I saw this, I didn't want to add it from the beginning to here because it was such a big deal. I couldn't believe I didn't see it. And when I tell you what it is, you go, ah, it's her her nostril flares. She does it 37 times in this one clip. And they're, <laughs> they're sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. Now, quite often when things happen like this, it's, it's like you can view it like a tick, like what her brother has. You know, so, but she's trying to get rid of that built up stress and tension. Now, usually when you see somebody flare their nostrils like that, I got a big nose. So it's going to be easy for you to see. And they'll do that. They'll do this with it. They'll, and breathe in. They'll, they'll flare their nostrils and push their, it's not lip compression. It's just, it is, but it isn't what we usually look at is what I call stress mouth or compressed lips. They smush their lips together with their teeth as they flare their nostrils. And when you do that, Anytime you goof around with your mouth or someone does and you touch your lips or push on your lips, that sends a signal to your, to your brain that says, let's relax. You need to relax. Something's up. And that's what we're seeing here. And that's what she keeps doing over and over and over. And and I counted, I, I think I, I was up to 150 something when I stopped and wow. then I started wow. again. But I got from the beginning up to now, there are so many of them and it it's, I don't want to say it's mind blowing, but I, I can't believe I didn't I didn't see it up to now. But look for it when you go back to because when once you start doing this on her, you're not going to be able to to stop looking at it or looking for it. Now, um, see if you can uh, all the panelists uh, see if you can count these as we go through on this. Um, how many times she does it? See if you can count the 37 that I found. There may be more, but this tells us that her stress level is higher than it looks initially. And this is her biggest, and I think only besides uh, a couple of those, uh, the see the leg rub, that might be one of the, the few adapters we've seen. That might be one, the only adapter. And I think that might be why we haven't seen any or seen very many. It's because that is such a, bi a big deal in here. So take a look at that from here on out, and you'll see it over and over and over again. Uh, che or Mark, what do you got? Uh, I, I, I've been, I think we're all done. Everybody. Are we? Okay. I was last. Hey, hey Chase, I, I came in late and, and scrambled through these. I missed and then, or I would have been all over that. You know that. Because when you say and then, yeah. Oh, yeah. This oh, big yeah. jump. Yeah. Yeah. But great. And, great and, catch. and Scott, I, I did not notice her nose. Yeah. Watch it. I've got a big one. Everybody go, oh, my God, what's wrong with his nose? Why does he keep doing that? But hers, I don't think it's petite, but it's not as big as mine. Okay. Um, I want to talk about where you went when you left your residence on the day of the murder. You tried to turn on to Trescott, and then you ended up where? I went, um, I was supposed to go to a party that night, a stock the bar party. So I went to a liquor store to pick up what they had asked for as the present for their party. Um, so I went to the liquor store, I picked up the alcohol, I stopped, I think I got gas, and then I went to lunch to meet my friends. And the liquor store purchase appears to have occurred at 1249 based on the receipt. Do you have any reason to dispute that no, timing? that sounds right. Okay, and then from there to the restaurant? Yes. And where was the restaurant located? Um, Mosaic. I actually don't remember. I just remember I would go north on uh, Thomasville Road. All right. And so it was... And is the restaurant where law enforcement came to speak with you and you ended up going with them to the police station, right? That's correct. Do you remember your earliest recollection of being frightened by one of your parents? Which parent? Your father. 
Yes. And what were the circumstances of this earliest memory of being frightened by your father? I was swimming. Do you remember where you were swimming? I was swimming at the, I believe it was called Ramapo. I'm not quite sure of the name. It was a, a lap pool. And what happened? Well, when I was in Muncie, I couldn't quite swim um, the 25-yard uh, pool without breathing. And he wanted me to do it straight without breathing, because that, that way you swim faster. And uh, I couldn't do it. So he would train me uh, to do it without breathing. And how would he do that? Uh, by grabbing my hair and dunking me under the water, and then uh, lifting me up and dunking me under the water again. Okay, Chase, what do you got? I think uh, this is truthful. We have uh, emotional recall right at the question. There's uh, body narration. He's moving his hands. He's illustrating, as uh, Scott will put it. There's eyebrow flash, which I think is, tr I think both of them showing this eyebrow flash is trained submission or conditioned submission, especially to someone who is in a position of authority, like an attorney, a doctor, uh, those types of people. So they, I'll talk about it in a second, but the suggestibility of an adult who was abused as a child is, is way increased. And is his memory of the event, this brings the behaviors to the present moment. And this technique, what asking about these events, brings the memories into the present. So the chemicals that were there, the feelings that were there are still very palpable and they're easier to bring in. And this is a technique uh, a lot of times that attorneys can use on the stand to get someone in a vulnerable state by asking questions about something completely different and then asking something challenging because I've accessed that vulnerable state first. And he used the word trained instead of abused. He would train me. Which I think speaks to his dysfunctional upbringing and how he was taught to view the world as this is natural, this is normal, and this is something that everybody else endures. Mostly truthful behavior here. Scott? Yeah, I'm gonna, I am gonna. agree with you. We're seeing the same stuff. His illustrators are good. He's loping along. Just tell that like he's, you know, like, he's, like it happened this morning. Uh, however, we do see an adapter. When uh, he says, when he talks about, I couldn't do it, we see him go like that. And when he says he couldn't do it, I think he's reliving that moment. And when his dad held him underwater and he saw it coming, he's like, I can't do it. And he's going to get, I think he was worried about it all the way up to that point where he grabbed him and stick him under. This is a violent thing that's going on here. This isn't just something where he would grab my, hold me underwater. The kid's flailing around, probably screaming, making noise. Apparently nobody else is around. It's just he and his father or his brother and his mother to do that and let that happen without running over there. How are you guys going to be able to let that happen? Not run over there and, and, you know what? That's going to be tough, man. So I think he's reliving that. That's what we're seeing, that little, that little grimace he's got. As he's, again, biting down on his mouth, on his, on his bottom lip. He's illustrating those moves of his father doing it. All these things are very smooth. Everything he's going along is very smooth. Nothing is, he's not stopping and, and it's all jerky and short little words and separated. Everything's just flowing right along there. Uh, his cadence, in other words, as Greg always uh, relates to it as or talks about it as. Everything's just it's just fine. Go along. There. He's telling like it's like it was no big thing. I think this guy got so far in their heads from since they were little, he's ruined them up to this point. You know, they they, they don't know what's normal behavior. I think so. For him, it, that could have been happening to everybody, and it wouldn't have bothered him. He, he, if you said it happened, my dad did the same thing. and say, yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? He wouldn't go. What are you kidding me? Because to him, that's normal. And to us, you know, most people, that, that that kind of behavior isn't normal. So, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing the same kind of stuff there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree with you there, Chase. Uh, the the abuse has been reframed as training. It's been softened. He would train me. Does that mean that it's, it's soft in his head? No, not at all. Uh, to Scott's point, as that lip retracts and pulls back, what you're seeing there is a signal of extreme stress, severe pain, and uh, severe psychological damage, essentially. That's what I would say that is an indicator of and is synonymous with. You know, there's small lip retract retractions that weren't, aren't going to mean that. That's a big lip retraction that, again, is a significant change. Notice the difference, how he is before 
that moment and after that moment. It's a big move. And because it's a big move, I'd say it is, it indicates a very big feeling. Now, we could suggest that maybe an element of it could be the the pain of not being able to swim underwater and 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 achieve the result that his father was was trying to get from him. But I think because it's so big and there's no shame attached to it, it really is just the reliving of the of the pain. I think it's about most likely about abuse. And therefore I would go down the route of, because it was so fast, so quick, that something did happen here that was abusive, almost, you know, torture for him. That's what that's what I got around that. Is that all of us? Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to go an entirely different direction on a couple of these things. But yes, I, everything you said, every one of you said, I saw the same thing. So I'm not going to beat those up. If you're raised in a hostile environment, if you've been through trauma many times in your life, you become hyper guarded as human nature. All of us who have been to war, all of that, we all recognize PTSD. People become hyper guarded, hyper protective and that kind of thing. I think this is my opinion. I think it's the reason he is clarifying who she's talking about. Which parent? Very specifically framing the question. It could be a family trait. Maybe it's just what they do. But if you've been in a hostile environment for a long time, you've got to be very careful which question you answer. Because if you answer the wrong question, things can go rough. The biting, I think it's a combination, again, of an adapter, that ability to control, but also protecting saying something else. I knew that I could not do it, and then I was going to get my whipped, you know, that kind of thing. Stopping short of what you would usually say. Again, he, I don't see any lying. I don't see a reason to lie here. He's just telling a story. And we also see the right eye accessing as he's doing recall. Family trait, maybe. He goes to his right as he's recalling what happened. And you can see the details and it's rote memory for him and that kind of thing. Now, here's the problem. Could it also be a rehearsed story? Sure, it could be. He's telling a story, but this is. there's no reason to lie about this. There's plenty of other things he could lie about to make it a lot worse. This is part of the why did why did I believe my parents would kill me solution. They've already admitted they've killed their parents. They've said a whole lot more hor horrific things that were going on between them and the entire family. So I don't see deception and I do see legalistic, hyper guarded. And then even when he responds to a question and finishes, he does that little count. The sniff, I finish that one and moves on to the next. That's what I got. Do you remember your earliest recollection of being frightened by one of your parents? Which parent? Your father. Yes. And what were the circumstances of this earliest memory of being frightened by your father? I was swimming. Do you remember where you were swimming? I was swimming at the, I believe it was called Ramapo. I'm not quite sure of the name. It was a, a lap pool. And what happened? Well, when I was in Muncie, I couldn't quite swim um, the 25-yard uh, pool without breathing. And he wanted me to do it straight without breathing because that, that way you swim faster. And uh, I couldn't do it. So he would train me. Uh, to do it without breathing. And how would you do that? Uh, by grabbing my hair and dunking me under the water and then uh, lifting me up and dunking me under the water again. You were here yesterday and you talked for approximately two hours. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And then you came here this morning and you talked for another hour or so, correct? Yes, sir. There's one thing I didn't hear you mention. The DNA. I'd like to talk about that with you. You're not disputing that your DNA is underneath Mr. Gehrman's fingernails, are you? Yes, I am. Okay. But you've heard the testimony. It's there, correct? I don't know if it was there or at what point it might have gotten there, sir. Okay, I'm not asking you how it got there. Are you really denying that your DNA is underneath the fingernails? Without knowing the truth, yes, I am. Okay, well, you've heard witnesses testify. Right. So you, oh, look, the DNA lab's in on it too? I don't know. I don't know at what point, I don't know what point how the sample was collected. 
Sir, please tell this jury, how in the world does your DNA get underneath Mr. Gehrman's fingernails? I don't know because I did not kill Mr. Gehrman. You have no idea how it could have gotten underneath your fingernails, correct? Under my fingernails? I'm sorry, under his fingernails, correct? I don't know that it ever was, sir. All right. Let, let's do it another way. You and Mr. Gammon are not friends, are you? No. Okay. You don't um, hang out with him ever? Sir, um, I did not ever hang out with Mr. when he was so alive. My question is yes. You didn't hang out with him ever, correct? I did not. He's never invited you over to his house? No, sir. You've never hung out, had drinks at a bar, correct? No, sir. There would be really no opportunity for him ever to put his hands on you in any sort of social situation, correct? Correct, sir. And yet, these two people who are not friends, your DNA just happens to be underneath his fingernails. Correct? No, sir. Okay. You just don't think it was legitimately placed there, correct? That it, it, I, or are you just ignoring the testimony of all of the witnesses that talked about how your DNA was underneath the fingernails? I, again, at some point or another, I believe it was planted because I did not kill Mr. Gurman. So, right. and, and by that logic, if you believe it was planted, you were at least admitting, yes, my DNA is underneath his fingernails, correct? Can you well, at least agree with me on that? Whether it came from a sample of fingernails or a different sample altogether, I don't know. I couldn't tell but you, the sir. The answer to my question is yes. you at least acknowledging my no, sir. physical DNA is underneath the fingernails. No, sir. Okay, great. So you're just going to disregard what, every, what all the other DNA witnesses said about this, correct? And, uh, you know, and okay. that's fair. That's fine. Totally fine. Let's, um, oh, well, I'm, I still want to touch on this. You would agree that if I came up to you and I scratched your face or scratched your chest, there's a possibility I could get skin cells underneath my fingernails, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You would agree that if someone was trying to fight for their life and were scratching at the killer, they could potentially get DNA from the killer underneath their fingernails. That's a possibility, right? Is that speculation or is that... No, no, I'm just asking you if it's a possibility. Um, I would imagine so. Okay. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so, um... Eyebrows raised again. I was just trying back then, Scott, to keep them as raised as as long as I could, and I only lasted about thirty seconds before it does really start to to hurt. So <laughs> good job on him for keeping them up uh, so long. Let's see uh, how much I can manage for uh, manage it for on this uh, round. Uh, eyebrows raised. There's vocal clicks. Again, stress, stress here, stress in the mouth. As well from the lawyer there, agitation. I'm trying, I'm trying to keep it here. Agitation, uh, aggression from him, steepling, um, unpredictable movement from the lawyer there. So, you know, inter I'm trying to keep it here. I'm, I'm doing my best. Interesting for him to play against that with such a, what I would call, oh God, I can't keep it, hang on. Uh, nonchalant <laughs> attitude, that nonchalant attitude that he's got, kind of lean back, but still with the lines in his forehead there. Those two things don't mix. It's really hard for me to be calm in this chair here and keep my head like this. Uh, nonchalant, by the way, uh, from Latin, non uh, chalere, uh, which means not, not hot, to be cold. So he's too cold and calm for this situation. He's being accused of murder. He's got a lawyer there who's steepling, who's being erratic, who's being a Aggressive. This is all too nonchalant, too uh, not hot, too cold, too calm. But with this going at the same time, God, really hard to do. Greg, what do you got on this one? There's a ton of incongruency in here, to your point. If he was going to be nonchalant, if he was going to be aggressive, either is okay. You can't be all of that at one time and come across the right way. Again, we're going to go back to I don't understand what you're insinuating. You know, he's acting like he just doesn't understand the concept, but he's also feeling like he's threatened. Those two things don't mesh. There's a problem. Anger is appropriate. Even Amber Heard knew anger is appropriate. She would lash out. There's a stage position where he's putting his hand up against his chin. And you said it early, Scott. We teach people to do that to relax muscles. But his is awkward and wooden. It is braced. It's locked. His chin is locked this way, but he's swaying. That doesn't fit. And when he does a head turn, he doesn't take his hand off his, off his knuckles. Yeah. He does a head turn with his... It's just so awkward and so weird. And then he does all that adapt or a release of nervous energy by swaying in the chair. And those things can become so habitual that they just are part of who you are. But that's not the case here. We know that he only does it when he's being hit. And his head 
tilts again when he gets a threat. He turns into a snarky kind of guy when he when he makes a point about when the guy was alive. I didn't hang out with him. I did not ever hang out with Mr. when he was so alive. My question is yes. You didn't hang out with him ever, correct? I did not. This is not the time to do that when you're on trial for your life or for murdering somebody. To come across as a snarky little bastard is not a good idea because people sitting across from you are going to hear that. And that's a good way to get yourself done in. This is a reason that most people are not good. Chase, the reason you and I both had to be taught to resist interrogation because we want to go in with a model that we're going to lock down. You guys remember the cop, Grant Harden, who came in and could not move at all and then suddenly started to move a little and you knew that he was going to come apart. The last thing here is you see he, his blink rate goes through the roof right as he gets called on it and he doesn't finish a sentence. He kind of stumbles through it. So you're just going to disregard what, every, what all the other DNA witnesses said about this, correct? And, uh, you know, and, okay. Scott, what do you got? When, you, when, the, when the attorney says, you don't know how your DNA got under his fingernails, he says, I don't know because I did not kill Mr. Gerber. When the answer should be, no, the cops put it there. And he should be excited and animated and loud. And he's not. Everything is the opposite of that. He's being quiet as he's talking about this. No, because I didn't. I did not kill him. And he doesn't cor contract that did not. He doesn't say, no, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't kill him. So he, this is this is pretty lame. I could go on and on about it, but it's pretty lame. And the lawyer didn't ask him if he killed him or not. He just asked him, you didn't know about the DNA under his fingernails. So this is, he thinks he's doing right. Now I agree with you, Greg. He's got some bad training somewhere. Or he watched something, he watched a YouTube video and just captured little parts of things that he should be doing. And I think he's doing all those things, like his eyebrows up in this thing. And, you know, no matter what happens, stay that way. Something like that's happened. Either somebody's told him that or he's seen that somewhere and he keeps doing it. You know, and I, I think his brain is in a panic. I think his limbic system is, is popping off and he doesn't know what to do at that point because he's a narcissist and he's, I would assume, and he's under the impression that he would know what to do and everything looks cool in the way it should, but it doesn't. And this is what it looks like when they think they're under control, but they're not. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so... There's no denial. This is this is where we would see a denial here from from 99 percent of people. This is a very key point here because we see crappy denials and soft denials uh, all the time. But when you see no denial in the context of something like this, that if if he were innocent would be the most powerful and confident denial of all time. And this is a giant red flag because of that. So when you're in a courtroom spotting whether somebody is in what I call performance mode or being genuine is a big deal. The difference between those, and it can totally change how the jury ju or judge sees that person. It is a huge deal. If somebody's in performance mode, there's a few things you can look for right away. And this is in a restaurant, doesn't matter. So they're first, they're stiff or controlled. They're trying too hard to keep it together. Next is the emotions. Their facial expressions usually don't match what they're talking about, uh, or they seem forced on the face. Next is speech, and they sound like they're reading from a script with no real ups and downs in their voice, and they might use fancy words that aren't really their style. I, again, at some point or another, I believe it was planted because I did not kill Mr. German. And finally, spontaneity. So they they pause a lot before answering, like they're trying to remember their lines instead of just speaking naturally. In regular life, there's usually a pretty stark difference between how somebody presents themselves publicly, which is maybe charming and successful, and how they behave in private, which is cold and critical. And this is one of the unusual traits that I would associate with a, as a narcissistic trait. And I'm not speaking ever in clinical terms here. I'm just using the word because I can. Is that everybody? Yeah. Yep. All right. Oh, Mark, that was beautiful. Yeah. Oh, shit. Been practicing that one all day. It worked. You I got it. It shows. <laughs> You were here yesterday, and you talked for approximately two hours. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And then you came here this morning, and you talked for another hour or so, correct? Yes, sir. There's one thing I didn't hear you mention. The DNA. I'd like to talk about that with you. You're not disputing 
Now, your DNA is underneath Mr. Gehrman's fingernails, are you? Yes, I am. Okay. But you've heard the testimony. It's there, correct? I don't know if it was there or at what point it might have gotten there, sir. Okay. I'm not asking you how it got there. Are you really denying that your DNA is underneath the fingernails? Without knowing the truth, yes, I am. Okay. Well, you've heard witnesses testify. Right. So you, oh, what, the DNA lab's in on it too? I don't know. I don't know at what point, I don't know what point how this sample was collected. Sir, please tell this jury, how in the world does your DNA get underneath Mr. Gehrman's fingernails? I don't know because I did not kill Mr. Gehrman. So you have no idea how it could have gotten underneath your fingernails, correct? Under my fingernails? I'm sorry, under his fingernails, correct? I don't know that it ever was, sir. All right. Let, let's do it another way. You and Mr. Gehrman are not friends, are you? No. Okay. You don't um, hang out with him ever? Sir, um, I did not ever hang out with Mr. Gehrman when he so was alive. My question is yes. You didn't hang out with him ever, correct? I did not. He's never invited you over to his house? No, sir. You've never hung out, had drinks at a bar, correct? Yes. There would be really no opportunity for him ever to put his hands on you in any sort of social situation, correct? Correct, sir. And yet, these two people who are not friends, your DNA just happens to be underneath his fingernails, correct? No, sir. Okay. You just don't think it was legitimately placed there, correct? That it, it, I, or are you just ignoring the testimony of all of the witnesses that talked about how your DNA was underneath the fingernails? I, again, at some point or another, I believe it was planted because I did not kill Mr. Gurman. Right. So, and, and by that logic, if you believe it was planted, you were at least admitting, yes, my DNA is underneath his fingernails, correct? Can you well, at least agree with me on that? Whether it came from a sample of fingernails or a different sample altogether, I don't know. I couldn't tell but you, the sir. The answer to my question is yes. you at least acknowledging... My no, sir. physical DNA is underneath the fingernail. No, sir. Okay, great. So you're just going to disregard what every, what all the other DNA witnesses said about this, correct? And, uh, you know, and, okay, that's fair. That's fine. Totally fine. Let's, um, oh, well, I'm, I still want to touch on this. You would agree that if I came up to you and I scratched your face or scratched your chest, there's a possibility I could get skin cells underneath my fingernails, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You would agree that if someone was trying to fight for their life and were scratching at the killer, they could potentially get DNA from the killer underneath their fingernails. That's a possibility, right? Is that speculation or is that... No, no, I'm just asking you if it's a possibility. Um, I would imagine so. Okay. Can we see how it was that the two zipper parts were positioned when you say that Mr. Torres was able to get his hand out. If you want me to do it, I'm fine to take your direction. Um, from what I remember, this is how the suitcase, this is how the suitcase works. This was up here. About right there now? Sure. Okay. I assume this one was much closer. It's not over there? Where did you where did you leave? You asked me where I zipped it. When when you say that it was zipped shut, show us. Are you talking about how I zipped it or when you're done yeah. zipping it hole. shut and he's inside of it, where are the zipper components?
Thank you. You can return to your seat. Okay, I'll go first on this one. If somebody that I loved died in a bag like that and they wanted me to touch it, I don't think I would be into touching it. I don't think I would be wanting to go near it. I don't think it, it would be tough to look at it. I don't think I want to have anything to do with it. And he actually says, you don't have to touch it. I'll do it if you don't want to do it. She just dismisses that, doesn't even address that part, really. You know, she goes in, puts her hands all over it, in it, tries to pull on it, turns it around, moves it around. No problem with getting right up next to it. This is where I was trying to decide if we're dealing with a psychopath or not. Here's why I think we're not. If we're dealing with what is known as a sociopath, it's because she's not trying to ingratiate herself with anyone. She's not got that personality type to try to make you like her. She's not being nice or anything like that. I think she's just been raised as, as the quote-unquote sociopath is, to where she, her feelings as a child weren't addressed. I don't think she had anybody saying to her, hey, listen, you know, don't do that. You know what my mentor called that? Mm -mm. Uh, they don't make eye contact with waiters. Mm -hmm. That's that's how he described that person. Like they don't they don't interact, they transact only. They'll just yeah. throw it out. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that makes sense. That makes sense. And you can always tell about a person who doesn't actually talk to the waiter or waitress or the the uh, uh, barista or whatever, if they don't lock with them. I make a lot of decisions about people seeing that. That's really, that, that's really a, that's a big deal. But if I love somebody and they would been in that bag or that bag had probably even been there, I wouldn't want to get near it, touch it, do anything. And she has no problem whatsoever touching it. So I think what we're seeing here is a person who has been disassociated from having the empathetic feelings similar to a psychopath because a psychopath doesn't have the equipment to let them have those empathetic feelings to create those. So I think that's why she doesn't have a problem feeling it, touching it, dismissing it, not staring at it. We don't see any emotion. When that comes up, we don't see any sadness. We don't see anything that lets us know that that suitcase bothers her. So I don't think we're dealing with a psychopath here. I think it's a soci she's a sociopath. And I, I think those are the reasons why. So that, that bothered me all the way up to that point. So I think that's... Uh, that's what we're saying, because we don't see any emotion at all, not even a little bit when it comes to that bag. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Mark brought this up earlier. Uh, I want to talk about her outfit, if y'all will <laughs> allow me to do that. As a trial consultant, I would never choose all black or all darks uh, for a woman on trial with her appearance. I would go through every single episode of The Office and make her subconsciously resemble Pam Beasley to that jury. It would be easy to do with that haircut and her body type. They wouldn't know why, but they would start to see that, and they'd feel a certain way about her. I wrote an entire chapter of these tricks. There's like, a, I think, 71 of them uh, in my new book, and it, this is definitely one that is really powerful. If you can harness it, we go into those... Uh, for jury psychology and uh, anybody's psychology can be manipulated that way, really. But these demonstrations can be very powerful, even though they seem stupid. It seems stupid. Why are they like, why is this relevant? Why is this important? Demonstrations create vivid, memorable moments that can impact jurors emotionally. So watching a suspect zip up a suitcase that somebody later died in brings emotional intensity to the abstract facts of the case. So all these random facts, now I see it happen. And that's kind of why we, we might be seeing that here. So bringing this mundane behavior of zipping the suitcase in front of the jury makes them visualize it, and it makes it visceral. It underscores these darker implications of what really took place. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, uh, I think everybody's spot on here. Scott, let me pick up further on this empathy piece, because I think you're spot on there. And there are many types of empathy. I'm just going to describe two of the types of empathy to you. Uh, and, and the empathy that I had with that suitcase piece. I had what what we call cognitive empathy with, with it. I think that's what you're talking about there, Scott, which is I, I understand the kind of feeling that somebody could have, you know, if they had emotional empathy for, you know, somebody dying in a bag that they're now 
touching. I think if I were there on the spot, I might get a sense of that emotional empathy. But right now, very detached from it. I can only have cognitive empathy, which which is me going, oh, that would be very odd. That would, could be a very odd feeling. But I'm not feeling the feeling myself. Uh, for some of you there, you might be watching that and you might actually feel something of a feeling. That would be you're having an emotional empathy, but I don't have that emotional empathy. And so because I'm not having emotional empathy for it, but I am empathetic, I have cognitive empathy. Both are very important. The place my mind goes, and, you know, somebody died in that bag, but because I'm only having cognitive empathy for it, where else my mind can go? And because most of this week I've spent more time in the air than I have on the ground, I go, this is a lesson in quality luggage because I just can't get over how stiff that zip is. And I can't get over my own emotional empathy of the frustration of having to kind of, the, the zip won't close. Because when I'm, you know, packing up, which I'm doing on a regular basis, I'm about speed and I need a, a very slick zip and you only really get that with very high quality luggage i mean that's what you're paying for that is what you are paying for and so my emotional empathy is with the frustration of that zip and my cognitive empathy is within you know wouldn't that feel odd if you had actually killed somebody or you knew the person and you were trying to do that so uh, the other thing, the other thing, again, because I'm in cognitive empathy and mo not emotional empathy, is I can't get over how this now just looks like an auction house. And we've got people dressed in suits with white gloves, and they now look <laughs> like they're handling some piece of conceptual art together. That's <laughs> so, what it looks like. Yeah, somebody's going to go, okay, we Antiques start the bidding on, on, on suitcase yeah, on the floor at a million dollars. A million dollars. Do I have a million dollars? Million dollars. Million, million dollars, 100. Million dollars, 100. On the phones. On the phones, million dollars, 200. And they get up to the five. Five million. Four, five million for suitcase on the floor. Going once, going twice. Five million. Five million to the Saudis. And and there we go. Can't get over that. Anyway, hope that was interesting on emotional and cognitive empathy. Greg, what do you got on this one? You know what I can't get over? Somebody stupid enough to get up and reenact a crime. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking? If you have an attorney, they have zero empathy for you at this point, and they're saying, hey, yeah, get up, go over there and show them exactly what you did. And by the way, since the zipper is sticky and you were drunk, that means you went through a little extra effort to get it to happen. <laughs> I mean, what the hell are you thinking? What are you thinking when that happens? By the way, if you ever go on trial and you fire all your attorneys and they ask you to get up and reenact a crime, don't do it. Just don't do it. Just say, hey, there's video of how it looked. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I will admit that I zipped it to here. I'm not getting up and doing that. That's just stupid. On unless, top of that. Unless you are Gwyneth Paltrow and you're the most comfortable person <laughs> in the room and you can make them feel like dipshits for doing yeah that. because you didn't commit a crime right. yeah <laughs> in this case you've admitted i committed a crime you're gonna get up and reenact it and you're gonna show how you fasten this guy in there and then later say you want me to demonstrate how i hit him with a bat when he was in there i mean what the hell are you thinking this is a clear somebody who thinks they're smarter than they are and they have a message you're going to deliver they're reinforcing everything we thought in the very beginning the first video she's getting up and doing exactly that and to your point, Scott, a guy died in here, not just a guy, somebody she knew. And if it was an accident, we should see the same behavior we saw when she saw that very first cop. You remember the very first cop all the way back at the beginning it was all that apprehensive and panicked and all that. That act is gone. That is gone. So now somewhere she's got to get back in the act. I don't know how that works. I think this is what goes on when you had a strategy two years ago and you chase back to the organism does what made the organism successful this person's gotten away with this stuff for two years or thinks she has scott back to your point of she has not thought of what she's not thought of and she stands up and does this in front of them this is i cannot imagine being sitting in the front row and not thinking wow that's pretty creepy that's pretty creepy that probably weighed in heavily what a dumb move that's all i got <clears throat> And Greg, right, do you me, know if this is the actual? Is this the actual case? Is that why they've got the white gloves? It's not a reproduction. Yeah, it's not a. Yeah. Mm. As a matter of fact, they go into details. The parts you guys didn't see because I clipped the videos. Of course, is they say there was not a paper clip on here, and they're very. Her, a lawyer tries to protect her a couple of times and tries to get her out of it, and says, "Hey, there was not a paper clip on there. There's a paper clip now, so she can't show you exactly how she would have done it." I, I object. There's video of where this thing was zipped. What, what happened to all that? Right. This is a this is ugly. This is ugly. Yeah. Let me bring up one thing about marking the luggage thing. Uh, 
usually when you see, let's talk about the way Mark looks here and the way he looks in, when when he's not in here. You see him out somewhere, for like for doing a show or something. We're all together. We go out, or if you travel with him, because we we have. When you see Mark on here, he, comparatively, he looks like a homeless person <laughs> with what he when it, what he wears on here to what he wears outside. You know, out in the, out in the wild. So. I don't know, and I've seen his luggage, and I can't. I don't know how he puts all that stuff in there. And we talked about that one time on a plane, Mark. Me and when mm -hmm. me and you were going to where we were going, and I still don't. It uh, my mind is blown how you can fit all that stuff in your bag, all those different suits where it looks like you just walked out of some Italian whatever it was, you know, suit maker, and they're all different. I don't know. I don't know how that's. I don't know how you pull that off. So I understand your concern. And your focus on, on, on the, the luggage, luggage here. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank so it's, you for your, your understanding and empathy on that. That's, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think she did when she was shopping for luggage? Hey, um, do you have anything big enough to fit my boyfriend? Right, right. Yeah. Let's go luggage shopping. I mean, you know, I would have gone with bigger. It's a tiny <laughs> case, isn't it? It's tiny. But tell him tell how much he weighed, Greg. 103. 103. Oh, he's tiny. Yeah. A little bit. She fell. weighed 90 something. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he's half me. Less than, yeah, half me. Yeah, less than half me. <laughs> Can we see how it was that the two zipper parts were positioned when you say that Mr. Torres was able to get his hand out? If you want me to do it, I'm fine. I'll take your direction. Um, from what I remember... This is how the suitcase works. This is how the suitcase works. This was up here. <clears throat> this was not this hard either. So this was like here. Okay. When you say that it was zipped shut, show us. Are you talking about how I zipped it or? When you're done yeah, zipping like it shut and he's inside of it, where are the zipper components? Thank you. You can return to your seat. All right, fellas. Thanks for another good one, and we'll see you next time.